God, who are we to deserve such a great gift? And you give this to us, not only freely, but, but relentlessly, speaking to us day by day, with every time the sun rises, we know that your faithfulness rises again. Every day when the sun sets, we know that you will, you will carry us. Even as our heads hit the pillow, your sovereign power runs a hemisphere that we are unaware of. And so God, if you can sustain us and we're not even paying attention, then I ask that you would speak to us now that we are. So Father, open your word, open our hearts, and give us the grace to follow you. We pray for this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have a Bible, you can open up to um, Galatians chapter 3. We're going to read verses um, 7 through, through 14. Uh, words are going to be up on the screen. Uh, there's Bibles in front of you, uh, probably on your phones too. So follow along however you would like, and then we will we'll read this passage. We'll come back, and we'll, uh, we'll kick it around a little bit. So Genesis chapter 3, starting in verse 7. Knowing then that it is those of faith who are sons of Abraham, and the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. So then, those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. For all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all the things written in the book of the law and do them. Now it's evident that no one was justified before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. But the law is not of faith, rather the one who does them, that is the one who, who lives by, who follows the law, the one who does them shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree, so that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. This passage is loaded. Understanding this passage will help us make sense of the entire Bible. One of the major themes that's packed into these seven verses is a theme that is stretched across the entire Word of God from Genesis to Revelation. And the theme is covenant. The covenant is contrasted with the curse in verses 10 through 12. Verse 10 says that all, verse 10 sets this up by saying that all who rely on the law are under a curse. All who rely on the law are under a curse. They're not functioning within the covenant, they're under a curse. Why? Because if you want to try to make yourself right with God by following the law, then you need to follow the law flawlessly. If there is a law, then there is a lawgiver. And if there is a lawgiver, then we don't get to have a vote into how the law, what the law should be. We need to follow and obey the rules. So, if you want to make yourself right with God by following God's rules, then you need to obey the law flawlessly. You don't, you don't have another choice. But even still, I know that some may, may push against that a little bit and say, but aren't some sins worse than others? Doesn't committing some crimes carry a bigger consequence than committing other crimes? And in a sense, that's certainly true. But it doesn't solve the problem. I mean, really, the only way that we can solve the problem of perfection on our own is by trying to create loopholes that can try to get us around the law. So one potential solution then is to say, well, maybe God should lower his standards. God's God of love. Maybe, maybe he should just lower what he requires of people. But is that a solution? Do you honestly want to serve and follow a God who is not completely just 
and simultaneously completely merciful. Do you want to follow a God who is less than perfect? I don't. Sounds kind of scary to me, actually. So then, maybe, maybe, <laughs> um, the, the other option we could, we could shoot for then is maybe we can lower our own standards. So maybe we could say, God can't adjust his, maybe we should adjust ours. But is that a solution? Do you want to be the kind of person that intentionally lowers their standards? Is that, do, I mean, do you want to be that? Do you want to be a person who intentionally says, yeah, those, those ethical values are just a little too high. Those moral values are just a little too good. I just, I don't think I want to be quite that good, so I'm going to settle for being like this good. Do you want to be that kind of person? A person of, of compromise like that? No. It's not going to help you. Lowering your standards isn't going to help you socially. It's not going to help you professionally. It's not going to help you psychologically. <laughs> this, trying to solve the problem of perfection through creating loopholes and lowering standards is not a solution at all. And this problem is only compounded by the way that Paul contrasts the law and faith, the curse and the covenant. Because this says, there's this clunky section in verses 11 and 12, and that's, that's what this is trying to get after here, that the law and faith, the covenant and the curse, these are not just alternative ways of relating to God. It's not like some people choose to obey God by following rules, even though that's the essence of every religion. Follow the rules right, and God will accept you. But trying to relate to God like that isn't just an alternative way to relate to God, and some people choose to relate to God through faith, some people through works. These aren't just different options. These are in contrast. They're completely opposite. They're in competition with each other. The law is inferior and has never been God's intention. Never. All the way back to Abraham. From the very beginning, way back into the book of Genesis, God has been preaching the gospel. From the beginning, this has been God's intention. That's what verse 8 says. That God was preaching the gospel to Abraham, saying that in you all the nations will be blessed. Now, <clears throat> this verse... If you're, if you're paying attention closely, this verse is probably, ought to be problematic for you. It was for me when I was studying this week. Because you look at this, you look at this verse, and it says, In you shall all the nations be blessed. Is that the gospel? If you're going to share the gospel with somebody, are you going to say, In you the nations are going to be blessed? There's no Christ. There's no crucifixion. There's no resurrection. There's no repentance. The gospel does not seem to be there. Or does it? Paul's quoting from Genesis 15 here. And whenever we read New Testament authors quote the Old Testament, we need to consider not just the specific verses that they say, but we need to be thinking through um, the broader passage that they're in, like the context of what they're quoting. Like if you're going to talk with your friends, you're going to quote a movie, um, there's no place like home, there's no place like home. What images come into your mind when I say that? Slippers, maybe some songs, maybe a little dog, even though you should get a big dog. Um, <laughs> like you're going to have some of these things come into your mind, Right? Like, I just say a couple of words, there's no place like home. And for many of us, there, there's images flood our minds, songs, maybe memories of when we watched that movie as a kid. That's what Paul is expecting to happen in the minds of his audience now. He quotes from Genesis 15, and he anticipates that they are going to connect the dots back to Genesis 15. And when they do, they will make an astounding discovery. In Genesis chapter 12, God makes a promise to Abraham. 
he says, I will make you the father of many nations. God, God makes this promise to, Je- to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. But between, if you pay attention, in between Genesis 12 and Genesis 15, there's all kinds of wacky things that wind up happening and the promise does not get fulfilled. And so then in Genesis 15, 8, Abraham asks God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? Seems like a simple question, but it's loaded. It's loaded. We miss this because we don't operate in that culture, but the original audience would have understood exactly what Abraham was asking for. Abraham was asking God to make his promise official by creating a covenant. This is fascinating. If you read through Genesis 12 and 15, you will see that the word covenant does not come up until Genesis 15. Between 12 and 15, it's all promise. Genesis 15, we get to a covenant, apparently, because as we'll see in a second here, God concedes, and he goes through the ceremony of making a covenant with Abraham. Apparently, God is not opposed to making a promise official through a covenantal ceremony. So God concedes. Abraham says, how am I supposed to know that you're going to make good on this promise? And God concedes to say, let's make good on this thing. Let's make this official. Let's cut a covenant right here. And that's what happens in Genesis 15, 9. Now, this is a weird story, but we'll try to clean it up. God said to Abraham, bring me a heifer, three years old. Now, wouldn't that be great? You pray, hey, God, uh, can I have this or that? And the first thing he says is, bring me a cow. <laughs> bring me a heifer, three years old, a female goat, three years old, a ram, three years old, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. That, that all made sense to them. I'm not going to get into it. Um, <laughs> and he brought him all of these, cut them in half, laid each half over against the other, but he didn't cut the birds in half. And when the birds of prey came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them all away. As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram, and behold, a dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. Skipping down to verse 17. When the sun had gone on, down and it was dark behold a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between the pieces on that day the Lord made a covenant with Abram saying to your offspring I will give this land what in the world is happening here if you've been tracking with our kids' ministry, uh, the, the devotional program we have set up, you, you would you know that the kids have actually just been going through this story, and they understand it. It's awesome. Um, if you haven't been tracking with our kids' ministry, and you do have kids, if you don't have access to the devotional material, it's linked up so that we can have what the kids are doing back there right now can be reinforcing what you do at home the rest of the week. Um, Kelsey's going to be in the lower level at the info center, just right down next to the coffee downstairs. Um, so if you want to learn more about how you can sync up your family with the, the children's ministry here, um, talk with Kelsey. She'll, she'll get you set up. But back to Genesis here. This is very very, very strange deal going on. This means nothing in our culture. But Michael Horton, in his book, God of Promise, uh, puts, puts the cultural details in place. He says that in the ancient world, there were many steps to creating a covenant. There were many steps that they had to take. And what was happening here in this covenant, in this treaty, um, was in Genesis 15. This is the last step of making that covenant official. And so this is how he explains it. He says that in addition to the treaty itself was the public ceremony that sealed it and put it into effect. Such ceremonies included an event in which the parties, the parties, would pass between the halves of slaughtered animals as if to say, may the same fate befall me should I fail to keep this covenant. It's exciting. (laughs) So when we read Genesis 15, we may find that a little odd, but I'm telling you, the original audience would have found it absolutely shocking. Because when you read what happens in Genesis 15, only one person passes between the halves of the slaughtered animals. Symbolically, it's God with a a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch. Abraham 
sits on the sidelines and watches God pass through an aisle of slaughtered animals. Why? Because God is saying to Abraham, and according to this passage, God is saying to Abraham and to us, may this fate befall me, should anything hinder this covenant being fulfilled. If anything gets in the way of this covenant being fulfilled, may I be slaughtered publicly, brutally. Do you see how God preached the gospel to Abraham? See how these dots are getting connected? We broke God's covenant. We haven't been faithful to live up to God's law. We have wavered in our faith and we haven't been faithful in our affections. So God took upon himself our penalty for breaking his covenant. Because Jesus didn't just walk through an aisle of slaughtered animals, he walked up the hill of Calvary to be sacrificed in our place. Jesus was brutally, publicly slaughtered, hung on a tree in our place, bearing our curse to break our curse, to usher in God's blessing and fulfill the covenant of God. Amen? That's what's going on here. And because God raised Jesus from the dead, we know that it is finished. The covenant has been fulfilled. The curse has been broken. Death itself has been conquered. God has done it all. God created Abraham, and he created you. God called Abraham, and he called you. God fulfilled his covenant with Abraham and his covenant with you. God bore the curse that we deserve for breaking that covenant, and it is God who carries you now. This covenant depends completely on the sovereign power of an almighty God. And because this almighty God is love, because he is good, he wraps us up in promises that are too big to be contained by this world and too good to be satisfied in this broken, fallen, cursed place. That's what verse 14 is about. In verse 14, God is letting us know that he's promising something that this world can't contain. He's given us his spirit. He's given us his spirit by faith that lives in us. The spirit that comes from a better world lives in our heart through faith, sealing us for God. Guaranteeing that one day we will see God. We will see God. He began it, he will carry us, and he will finish it. And so church, since one day we will receive every blessing God has promised, every blessing God has promised has been secured eternally in Christ, we must hold on to these promises. Now, just because some charlatan preachers abuse the promises of God does not mean that we shouldn't enjoy the promises God has given us or look forward to the way that he intends to fulfill them. God's promises are too big to be satisfied by anything in this world. Consider Abraham. Abraham would have settled for one baby, but God is going to make him the father of many nations. Abraham would have settled for a sliver of desert land, but according to Matthew 5.5, 5, the meek shall inherit the earth. According to Hebrews 11, Abraham wasn't going to be able to fully receive, receive any of this because God had something better for Abraham and something better for us so that with Abraham together, we could experience something that the law cannot earn and this world cannot contain, eternal paradise. And so for you, for me, you may want to be the CEO of a Fortune 500 company, but God promises that you will rule and reign with Christ in a redeemed world. You may long to see segregated communities come together, but God promises that one day 
all people from every nation, tribe, and tongue will gather in unity around his throne, worshiping him with unhindered praise. You may wonder if your pain and suffering is worth it. But God promises that not one tear will be wasted, not one ounce of pain will be forgotten, because every tear you cry, every struggle we go through, the Bible's promises is achieving for us a glory that will blow it all away. Your heart may ache to find true love, but through the gospel, the truest, purest love has already found us. So, we can go out into this world with hope because our hope isn't in this world. Our hope is in a better world. So we don't have to settle for promises that could be satisfied in this place. So this isn't our home. It's not supposed to be perfect. And if we try to make it perfect, we're going to be wasting the resources God has given us. We can live for a better world. Jesus promises. Jesus has secured promises promises for you from a better world. But this isn't just for you. This is for the nations. This has been God's plan from the beginning. And when we live this out intentionally, intentionally going with the love of God across the world and across the street to to share how much God loves the people who do not yet know how much God loves them, we can see more and more of this promise being fulfilled. And when we intentionally embrace people who are different from us, we demonstrate to a watching world that the gospel has the power to heal and reconcile all people. Because through Christ, all people can be reconciled to God. And so we embrace each other. We embrace people who are different than us because God has embraced us. And when we do that, we demonstrate to a watching world that Not only do we believe Jesus is alive, but he's powerful. He's active right now in this place in your life. This morning, we have an opportunity to put this all into motion by celebrating communion. Jesus set this up, even talking about the covenant, Mark 14, 22. And as they were eating, he took bread. And after blessing it, he broke it, and he gave it to them and said, Take this, my body. And he took a cup. And when he had given thanks to them, and they all drank it, he said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. So we're going to put this into motion today. We're going to put the celebration of this covenant into motion today by celebrating the Lord's Supper, by celebrating communion. Now, this is a time for those who are in covenant with Christ through the gospel. You don't have to be in covenant with Mago Day Church, but you do have to be in covenant with God through Christ to celebrate communion because that's what this is about. This is an opportunity for those who have who are in this covenant, who have received the sacrifice that Jesus paid for them. If you're not there yet, but you want to be, take that step today. Do it now. Give your heart to God and know that God will give you bigger promises than you would dare to ask for. Turn to God in your heart and do it now. Just like we've been talking about, this isn't about how well you perform. The law and faith are in contrast to each other. This is about letting go of your performance and holding on to Christ. So if you want to make that decision, do it today. If you're not sure about that, that's all right. Know that we are so glad that you are here, and we hope that you keep on coming back and examining what God may have for you. But this is a time, communion is a time for those who are in covenant with God through Christ. So the way we celebrate communion around here, it's a little bit different than you may be accustomed to if you've done this before. When we celebrate communion here, uh, you'll come up the center aisle. When you get to the table, you'll be served by the person in front of you. After After you have been served, you'll turn around and serve the person behind you. 
and then you'll exit out the side aisles. I just, I love this. I love the way God has let us do this because when we celebrate communion this way, we get to live out what God has told us to do. We get to receive the gospel again. We get to extend the gospel to the person behind us. We get to watch somebody else receive the gospel. We get to, to go back to our seats and sing songs. This is, it's, it's heavenly. It's heavenly. And this, this reminds me of, the, of maybe, maybe, what the procession in heaven is going to be like. We're, we're going to watch people come to the throne of God and say, thank you. And we're going to watch and we're going to sing and we're going to praise and Jesus will be glorified. We get to do that right now. Right now. So I'm going to pray. The band is going to come up. We're going to sing. We're going to celebrate communion. When your heart is prepared, come on up. If there's sin you need to confess, confess it. This isn't about your performance. It's about Christ. If there's promises you haven't, you haven't grabbed from God, know that Jesus has died in your place. God is yours. Would he who gave up his own son withhold any good thing from you? Let's let our doubts turn into faith and praise now. Let me pray. God, thank you. Thank you that we can worship you. Thank you that we can praise you. 